Right on. Um, you can go ahead and turn to Judges chapter 6. Um, we'll get there in a minute, but you can go ahead and begin preparing yourself there. Um, I'm going to go ahead and open up in prayer. Dear Lord, I thank you for giving me this opportunity to present your word. God, I pray that you just give me the words to speak and that everything I say would come from you. Use your word to pierce our hearts, renew our minds. Thank you for what you're going to do in this place. Amen. 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 How many of you have either played a team sport or you're involved in some sort of competition growing up? Anybody? See, I love competition. It's my entire life, was it? Um, you know, I can't remember a year of my life that I wasn't playing some sort of sport. Usually it was, you know, baseball and football, basketball, something. I was always doing some sports, loved it. And then as I got older, I got into junior Bible quiz, teen Bible quiz, and fine arts with my church. And I just, I love the competition aspect. Um, most of my childhood friends and memories come from those situations. You know, the Little League traveling around playing baseball, um, two a days in high school football, all that stuff. Like, that's where the memories come from. You know, it's just the struggle, all that good stuff. Um, and so I just love that stuff. I've, I've always loved it. I love being a competitor. I feel like competition just, it shows your true character in a lot of situations. You know, you get to go in to just you know, see what you got. You get to push yourself into just tough areas and just really control your character. Um, having the opportunity to rise to an occasion and face an impossible challenge just excites me so much and makes me want to perform to a higher level than ever before. And that's just what I love about competition. It's getting to try to perform and like, rise to a challenge. It feels like it's impossible. Um, as much as I love competition, I hated being the underdog, though. I always hated when people looked down at me because, like in high school, I was the smallest lineman on my team. Like, so I was always, you know, looked down at the underdog. And so that's just kind of what I always had to deal with. And I hated it because I felt like I was one of the stronger ones, and I knew I was one of the faster ones. So I was like, you shouldn't, you know, but it is what it is. Anyway, um, I am convinced that my like competitive streak comes out in an underdog setting even more because then you're trying to prove something, you're trying to prove, you know, it's not luck that I'm doing this by, I'm doing this because I worked hard even when I didn't need to, even when people looked down on me and said there wasn't a chance, you know, still working hard. And I think one of the biggest times that I got to witness, like, you know, working hard when there wasn't a reason to was this summer. I worked at a youth camp and every week they broke up the guys into different teams and the guy counselors got to leave each team and they gave me the absolute liabilities. I'm talking about I had the 13-year-olds, everybody else had high school guys. One team had two guys that are now playing football in Alabama, and I had kids that were like 5'5", five, five, 93 pounds, and I'm like, great, this is going to be awesome. Um, and it was my first year working, so they were like, you know, just trying to give me a hard time. I guess it was some sort of like, rite of passage type deal. Um, I was horribly outnumbered, had no shot of winning, but I didn't let the odds count me and the guys out. Um, I got out there, and I just rallied my group of toddlers, and I was just like, guys, we got this. And a disclaimer, if I'm ever the fastest person on a team, there's a problem. And I was far and away the fastest person on this team, so it was just an issue from the get-go. I knew it was going to be tough. Um, the only other time I've been the fastest person in a situation was whenever an ice cream truck was involved, and that's kind of my standard for speed. Anyway, I get my guys together, and I'm starting to give this pep talk. I'm like, guys, today is the day. You know, it doesn't matter how big you are. It doesn't matter how fast you are. It doesn't matter how strong you are. It matters what's in your heart, and if you're willing to push through when no one else is willing to push through. If you're willing to give it everything you've got right now. And I'm just trying to give him like, to rally him. In the back of my mind, I'm like, guys, there's no shot. And I'm like, I'm not selling you out. We got this. Let's go for it. Um, we get out there, and they have no reason to try. I'm talking 15 seconds in, we're already blown out of the water. The first contest was, you know, you know they throw a football like 60 yards. Kids have been running around the bases. My kid throws it 20 yards. Everybody else is like slinging. It's like, we're way behind. We're struggling from the get-go. And I'm like, you know what? We got this. Let's go. Let's go. And these kids had no reason to persevere. They had no reason to try to come back. They were mostly middle school kids going up against high schoolers. But they weren't, all, they weren't from the same church, and there was no bond holding them together. But for some reason, they just decided, you know what, we got this, let's go. And they started rallying around each other, started pushing themselves, because I don't know, if I like to say it was you know, because I was pushing them, saying, you know what, I'm on your side, I got you, let's go, let's go, let's do this, let's fight, let's push on. Um, the final part of the race is uh, counselors do a canoe race across the lake. And I knew if we were close at that point, I was like, I can get us there. I can make us win this if you just get me close. And so we're going, and we get close. Like we're in second place, third place, right there when we hit the water. And I'm pretty far behind first place, but all these kids are yelling and going nuts and going crazy. And I'm like, you know what? They're going nuts. I'm going to do this for them. Like, and I was dying. I was wanting to cry, honestly. I was sweating. I was dying. It was just so much work. But I crossed the finish line at this big cinematic moment. And all the kids are going crazy. You would have thought they just won the Little League World Series. In reality, they had just, you know, won a 15-minute relay. Um, but for them, that's all that mattered. So for the rest of the week, that's all they cared about. They were going nuts. Everybody else already left and went to lunch, but they were still there celebrating and going wild. And I learned something in that moment that the DYD didn't teach me, that the speakers that came and spoke didn't teach me, and that I wouldn't have learned any of their context. I learned that um, regardless of the outcome and regardless of the fact that no one may be on your side, if you go out there and you do what you know you're supposed to do, and you go out there and you work, and you trust in God, the results are going to come. And they stood up to the challenge, and they knew that what the... Um, 
they were going to do it, it wasn't just for themselves, they were doing it for the other junior hires in their youth group. Because who remembers being the junior hire in the youth group? You know, kind of being like the low man on the totem pole, everybody kind of like giving you a hard time. And so they were doing it for every other junior hire, you know, trying to step out and say, no, we got this. We're going to do this for the little man on the totem pole. And I love stories like that. And in the Bible, if you read throughout any part of the Old Testament, the Israelites are always the underdog. They're always the low one on the totem pole. They're always getting pushed around and always looked down upon. Um, one of my favorite stories in that is, well, I mean, some of the bigger stories you can think about are you know, David and Goliath, um, Joshua, the Battle of Jericho, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the burning, um, fiery furnace. That's the word I'm looking for. Um, and those are like some of the main stories that come to your mind. But one that I really love is one of the less glamorous side because all those, you know, King David was known as a man after God's own heart who God sought out way before he was even ready. That's, that's a beautiful story. Or Joshua, he was trained up by Moses. You know, he was prepared for that moment his whole life. Like that's what he was going to do. But one of my favorite ones is Gideon because his wasn't as God ordained. His was, you know, it was pretty messy. And as a messed up sinner, as someone who's gone through some junk and doesn't belong, you know, standing in front of people speaking life and other people, I love the story of Gideon because he's an underdog. So people gave up on him, people cast out, people said, you don't have a shot. But because God was on his side, because God took him on his side and said, I've got, you've got this, and I'm here with you, then it was able to take him to the next level. Um, you see, these examples, they're great and they're like, inspirational and they're incredible, but sometimes they just feel too glamorous. And so I love seeing like, the real deal issues, such as Gideon. Um, Gideon is one of the lowest of all the Israelites at this time. He is from the tribe of Manasseh, which is one of the lower tribes, and he's the youngest man in his family. So he's way down the pole. Never really would have gone up higher than that. Never really would have reached farther than that. His lot in life was pretty much just, you know, stay where he was. Um, if we start, um, we're in jo uh, <coughs> Sorry about that. I said the wrong chapter, but we're in Joshua chapter 6. <laughs> <laughs> I just realized that. Um, but it says, starting in verse 7, When the Israelites cried out to the Lord because of Midian, he sent them a prophet who said, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I brought you up out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. I rescued you from the land of the Egyptians, and I delivered you from the hand of your oppressors. I drove them out before you and gave their land. And then skipping down a little bit further. Um, the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon and he said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon said. But if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all of his wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, Did not the Lord bring us out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us to the hand of Midian. The Lord turned to him and said, Go in the strength you have and save the Israel out of the hand of Midian. Am I not sending you? Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon said. But how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. The Lord answered, I will be with you, and you will strike down the Midianites, leaving none alive. I don't know about you, but I feel tough for Gideon right here. And I understand where he's at, you know, saying, look, I'm the lowest of the low. I'm the least of the least. I, I shouldn't be doing this, because I look at my life, and I don't belong where I'm at. I don't belong being able to have the calling of God to say, you're going to go out and speak to, you know, young adults, and you're going to speak to teenagers' lives, and show them that God cares about them, loves them. And honestly, it terrifies me at times to think about that. Um, but what sticks out to me is the location. You know, Gideon's in the wine press, but he's threshing wheat. I don't know a whole lot about wine, but I do know it comes from grapes and not from wheat. So that means to me that like, Gideon is hiding. He's hiding away from the Midianites. He's scared and he's cowering back already because he knows his lot in life is to stay back. He knows that he's not going to be like at the forefront, not pushing. So he's already hiding. And then the thing I just love is that the angel was just sitting there under a tree waiting for him. And first off, you know Gideon is terrified whenever he comes out and sees someone he's never seen before and like addressing him. But I love what he addresses him as when he says, mighty warrior. Because at this time, Gideon is not a mighty warrior. He's hiding in a wine press, threshing wheat. He's known as the son of Joash. But what I've realized is sometimes you've got to speak stuff into existence before you can see it. You know, as future ministers, that's what we're going to have to do. Whenever we have, you know, people in our ministry, they have giftings, they have talents, they have abilities, they have all these great things for their life but they may not see the end result that we can see because God's given us that ability to see the potential in their life. And so we've got to speak into existence before it's even there. Yeah. Sometimes you're going to have to find a kid and call him a mighty warrior when he's still an awkward sixth grader mm -hmm. terrified to even look anybody in the eyes. Sometimes you're going to have to call somebody the father to the fatherless when his dad abandoned him when he was five years old and he has no reference of what it's like to be a father. And so that's what our job is, to find people and to call things out of them and to push them in areas they've never thought to be pushed in before. Um, we see other people, you know, such as like, King David, who was known as a man after God's own heart, or you know, people along that line, they were known by their uh, by what they've been by what they've done. But if you look at Gideon, first off, he's known as the son of Joash, which means he's done nothing yet. He's done a little bit of his father's name. He's still having a little bit of what other people have done. But then here we see this angel calls him a mighty warrior. You see, this is where everything shifts for Gideon. He goes now from being just the lowly son of Joash, who's in one of the lower tribes, the lowest in his family, the weakest clan. So now he's a mighty warrior. He's being brought up into a higher position, and God's calling him to something new that he's never been in before. Um, let's see. 
Have you had that moment in your life yet where God's just like shifted some things where, you know, you thought this was your life in your life, you thought this was what you were called to, you thought this was your name, and then God came in and he just switched it and he said, no, this may have been where you were, you may have struggled with this, you may have been weak and falling off to the side before, but here you are, you're my son, and I've called you into this moment for such a time as this to rise up and to do something no one else can do. These are the kind of moments that are going to change your ministry. Whenever you get down, when you start doubting yourself, when you start wanting to give up, look back on those moments because that's what's going to propel you forward and it's going to keep you going. So you can find another kid like you that people should have cast out, people should have just thrown to the side, but they rallied around you. And you've got to find those kids and rally around them whenever your time comes. Going back to the story, two nights later at the same camp that I was working at, I was down in the office praying over students like we did every night. And suddenly someone comes up, like grabs my shirt and starts pulling on the back of my shirt. And I turn around, and it was one of the kids that was on my team. He has tears in his eyes, and you could just tell he had been just boo-hooing, probably all service. And we went over there, he asked if we could talk, and so we got to the side and started talking. And he's telling me how he felt this call to ministry because he just wants to impact people's life for Jesus. And he just wants to like, you know, show them the love that he's been showing and just encourage them to go further. And it was just a huge moment for me because then after I sat there and talked to him and prayed with him, I saw him go up and start praying for his friends and praying for the kids who he came to camp with and praying for kids he'd never seen before. And it just, it reminded me so much of like when I was in middle school and I felt the call for the first time and I went out and did that. It was such like a great like, circle of life moment where I got to see another kid stepping into what God's calling him to do. The kid's 13 years old. I mean, he doesn't understand the fullness of what he was doing then, but me at 21 getting to see another kid doing that, yeah. it was just so monumental for me because it showed me, you know, what you're doing matters. And the things That's you good. do now, and the, the things behind the scene, what you're doing in the wine press, that matters because it can prepare you for what you're going to be doing whenever you're calling out warriors later in your life. Um, you saw Gideon was very hesitant, and he didn't want to do this. You know, he kept saying, you know, pardon me, Lord, or pardon me, Lord, you know, hold up, let's, let's review this real quick, because you know who I am, right? You know I'm the lowest of the low. There's no business me being out here running things. I'm not a mighty warrior. I'm, you know, the lowest back here. And Gideon replies to God, and he says, if now I have found favor in your eyes, give me a sign that it is really you talking to me. Please do not go away until I come back and bring my offering and set it before you. The Lord waits to his return, and Gideon realizes that he saw the Lord, because the Lord, the angel of the Lord, like, um, consumes the sacrifice and everything that Gideon brought to him. And so Gideon gets just amped. He's so high all of a sudden. He's like, this is God. Like, this is God calling me to do this. So he goes and he tears down the Asher pole, which is to the false god of Baal. And he tears it down and makes it into an, um, to an altar to God, and then he runs a sacrifice on it. And I'm paraphrasing this a little bit, but in this moment of blind courage, Gideon goes and destroys this <coughs> monument. Like builds a sacrifice, and then he wakes up the next morning and realizes what he did, and he goes and hides behind his dad again. You know, he has all, he's the mighty warrior. He's beginning to step into that calling. So like, we see here God's like building, down, or building up his confidence, taking away his doubt. And then all of a sudden, he goes right back to being the son of Joash again. He's hiding behind his dad's shirt, and he's letting his dad go and fend off the people who are trying to kill him because he killed the, or because he ruined the altar. And so this, is, this would be a huge disqualification in most of your big stories. You know, if you want your hero to always be a hero, you want him to stand firm at all times. You want him to always rise to the occasion. But here we see Gideon falling back. And that's what I love about the story of Gideon is he never had it perfect the whole way through. He kept making mistakes. He kept having issues. He kept falling back. But he always came back to God. And so Christ allowed him to constantly continue being worked on. And did Gideon fall short? Absolutely. Did this damage his confidence and make him want to quit? I have no doubt. But redemption isn't about living a perfect life every single day. It's about surrendering your life to Christ and letting him work on you day in and day out. And eventually, maybe you'll start getting some stuff right. That's not every single day, though. You have to be willing to you know, fall back and make mistakes on Monday, but on Tuesday, you've got to hit it harder than you did Monday. And you've got to keep trying to go further and further in your, life, in your walk with Christ every single day, making progress every day. Um, the time is coming where the uh, Midianites and Amos are closing in, and God calls Gideon to prepare the troops. And so if we're looking at verse 36, Gideon said to God, if you will save Israel by my hand as you have promised, look and I will place a wolf fleece on the threshing floor. If there is dew on the fleece only and all the ground is dry, I will know that you will save Israel by my hand as you have said. And then that happened. So Gideon rises up the next day and he says, all right, God, let's flip it. This time, make the ground wet and the fleece dry. Whenever I hear this preached, I always hear um, <coughs> Gideon, like, Gideon's always doubting God. He's always terrified. And we call the fleece like a negative thing. It's always put it just like a, you know, he's terrified. So he's looking for God to not do it. He's saying, God, please don't do it. You know, don't make this happen because I don't want to have to go out and do this. So please have the fleece be wet and the ground be dry. And then please just keep me safe. But what I want to, I want to get rid of that. I want to change the way we look at it. Because the way I look at it is, in ministry, I've been, there's been so many times I'm like, God, are you sure? Like, are you positive that I'm supposed to be doing this? Because I know me. I don't know if you know who I am. I don't know if you know where I've been. But I know me and I know this is not where I belong. I belong, you know, I should be sitting in the back pew just praying that the pastor doesn't look me in the eyes because I don't need the conviction of, you know, my mistakes in my life. 
But what I love with this is he's saying, you know, you can't just stay in your feeling of doubt. And Gideon's doing the same, God, I want to do this, but I want to make sure you're coming alongside me. I want to make sure that what I'm doing isn't from me. It's not from myself. I want to make sure I'm going straight into your will. I want to make sure I'm walking in your calling. Um, you can't just stay in your feeling of doubt. When you get to that place, you have to get along with God and think back to the times he's spoken to you before. Think back to the times where he's called you and prepared you. Think of all the things that have led you to that moment. Um, it's okay to be worried in moments like that. It's okay to call out and pray to God in moments like that. God isn't just a boss that gives you a list of responsibilities and wants results by the end of the week. He's a very present help in a time of need. It's not a corporate ladder where you have to you know, fight your way up to the top and you have to work your way to you know, being on a certain level to be a pastor. It's a family unit. And so you have to be able to you know, work alongside those around you. You have to build each other up and encourage each other. You know, Gideon should have, I wish Gideon had people alongside him who were with him and saying, you know what, you're struggling, but I'm with you. And so it's like a family unit. That's what we've got to be able to be for each other as a body of believers. It's we have to build each other up and be each other's fleece. You know, let them know, hey, I'm on your side. You've got this. You've made it this far. Let's keep going. Keep pushing. Keep pushing. Um, I've never heard the fleece put in a positive light, but you know what? Doubt doesn't make you less of a Christian. Doubt doesn't make you a weaker believer. Um, as long as you, as long as you purpose in yourself to keep moving and to keep following and keep serving Christ, regardless of your doubt and fears, you can lay out as many fleeces as you want. You know, don't be afraid just to you know, say, God, I just want to make sure you're on my side in this. I want to make sure you're still with me in this. Um, we as believers, we should rally and support each other in those moments. Whenever you see somebody else that's like struggling and doubting and hurting, Instead of sitting there like mocking them for laying out fleeces in life to make sure they're doing what God's will is, come alongside them and encourage them. You know, give them a scripture that you've clung to whenever you're doubting yourself. Or give them just a quick encouraging word that you've heard before in your life that you know they need in that moment. Um, and then here we get to the part where Gideon begins um, taking heart and selecting men to you know, become his troops for him. He has 32 men show up. And you know, at first, like, okay, we're feeling good. You know, things are going all right. 32,000 men, we can survive with this. It's a decent number, and a lot of them have fighting experience. <coughs> But then God just throws him a curveball. And don't you just love when God throws that curveball at you? And he just comes in and says, all right, anyone who's scared can leave. 20,000 men leave. I mean, everyone almost. That's two-thirds of the men. They all leave. And um, for, example, like, for me, I've had those curveball moments. And one of them was I had a full ride to Alabama to go to school. And I was like, okay, I'm going to go get my kinesiology degree, you know, and then I'll become a pastor later in life. Um, and then God was like, okay, so you know, you're going to put your calling, what you've been told to do, what you've known since seventh grade, you're going to put that on the back burner, you're going to wait around, and you know, maybe eventually, if it's okay with you, you'll become a pastor like I've called you to, and I've set you apart for all your life. And that was just a big, like, you know, like, all right, God, you know, I'll get down to Florida 500 miles away from home with still having you know, to pay for it and not being a free ride, mm. because you've called me to it, so I'm going to go for it. We'll see what happens. Let's see how this goes. And see, God came in, and he threw away all the doubt and the fears, and he pulled me into my calling, letting me know that I can't cower in fear for four more years and hoping that he changes his mind and calling me. I have to step into it, and I have to come down here to Southeast University and get poured into and get trained up so that I can become the pastor I've been called to be. Um, so we're down to 20, or the 22,000 men leave, and now Gideon has 10,000 men. And so you're, okay, you know what? This is good shape. Your faith's been tested. God's going to just take those 10,000 men, and they're going to go do their thing, right? Wrong. God takes them through another challenge, and 9,700 other men leave. So now it's down to 300 men. Oh, and I forgot to mention that they are fighting 135,000 well-trained soldiers. So first off, they were already outnumbered three to one. And now it's 300 to 135,000 men. Um, so at this point, I don't know about you, but my faith is well more than shook. I'm very terrified, and I'm realizing that, you know what, there's no shot. I don't have a chance. God, I know you're powerful, and you used to do these things for us in Egypt, but I don't know if you've seen the Midianite army. There's only 300 of us. I don't know what you're planning on doing, but unless you send me about 130,000 angels, we're going to be in trouble. But Gideon doesn't do that, and he goes on, and God comes on their side, and they win the victory. So my question to you is this. What area of your life needs some fleece to be thrown in? You know, where are you having some doubt? Where are you struggling? Where are you hurting right now? Has God spoken a big dream into you often and you know you're not prepared for it? Good. Because that means he's on your side. That means he's fighting with you and he's fighting for you. Yeah, he wouldn't give you a big dream if he wasn't going to be a bigger God in the situation. And the same way, if God's called you, it doesn't matter how much doubt and fear you have. You just have to respond and follow it's tough and it's challenging. At times, you're going to feel wrong. You're going to feel like God messed up and he shouldn't have called you to do it. But if he's called you to it, he's going to call you through it. He's going to walk with you every step of the way and he's going to get you out of this. So I challenge you to step into that calling or that dream that God's spoken to your life. And if you're scared, get in line because I've been there every single day of my life. Every time I step into a situation like this, I realize where I've, where I've been, where I should be. And for some reason, God decided to put me here. Um, so instead of walking in that fear... He will be with us always. And he gave us the Holy Spirit to come alongside us in these situations, to give us that strength, and to just give us that peace to know that he is God and he's with us. Um, 
So just get some time with God this week and allow him to remind you that you're calling, of what your calling is and to show you that he's there with you and he's in the corner with you. And yeah. He doesn't want to see you fail. He doesn't want to see you fall apart. He's there to build you up and strengthen you to do greater things than you can ever ask, seek, or imagine. So mm -hmm. can we pray?